All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk about federalism today. And I know that that's a word that you've heard before. Oh, just once or twice in this school year. But we just were talking about the Constitution and talking about how um, we have a balance of power, how we have balance of power in the branches, but also between the states and the national government. So first of all, federalism, here is your straight out definition, system of government, which a written constitution, rule of law, divides the powers of the government on a territorial basis, meaning that the state governments are considered local and they are separate to an equal from, or well, let me try that again, separate from and equal to the central government, which is our national, or we also call it federal government. You know this. I've tested you on it pretty much all year. There are some benefits to federalism, the federalist system. For one, it, it allows local action on matters of local concern. So things that matter to the state of Montana might not matter to people in New York. You know, if we had um, grizzly bears running through our schools, that's not a problem New York would face. So it's something that Montana could deal with. And if for another reason, if Canada tried to invade us, um, or was giving us pressure, then we could have the federal government there to back us up. Things like gambling, voting policies, and speed limits, these are all things that are um, get local action and they're a matter of local concern. To some extent, speed limit can change. It presents an, a concept of local control with united strength. We can take care of what we need to take care of on the local level or on the state level, but we know we have the backup of the United States federal government. So if we had a natural disaster, if we needed military protection, these are the things that the uh, national government could help us with. It does also safeguard against the uh, national government from becoming too powerful, because if you remember in the Constitution, the 10th Amendment says any powers not given to the national government or denied to the states are actually reserved for the states. And because of that, there are a lot of things that the national government shouldn't be able to meddle in. It encourages citizen participation. Washington, D.C. seems really far away from us. It seems like, what can we do there? There's nothing we can do. Uh, but you can get involved on the local level. Those of you who come to city council meetings can see how much um, influence you can have as a citizen on the local level. And also it provides a, a greater variety of responses to the issues. I mean, Montana might be limited on how it might deal with certain situations, but if we have the federal government there too, um, we can get more information and more um, support, more ideas from that level of government. There are some disadvantages though. Uh, one, it can create confusion about authority or jurisdiction. Who is in charge of that? Does the federal government get to tell me um, whether or not marijuana can be legalized? Or is that something that the states get to tell you about? If the states legalize it, but the federal government says it's illegal, then who has the authority there? Well, we know who has the authority, and it is this, the federal government because of the supremacy clause. It does slow the government response. And, the, and this is the example, if you look at this picture, this is a picture from someone suffering from at, a victim of Hurricane Katrina. And the story of Katrina was there was this massive uh, hurricane coming in to um, the United States, into New Orleans. And if you know, New Orleans is shaped sort of like a bowl. It probably shouldn't even exist, but there's a whole levee system and it's shaped like a bowl. And the hurricane came in. I remember even getting ready for work and, and, and watching this and being nervous about it. And it caused a little damage, but not much. And then the levee started breaking. And the levee started breaking and that bowl that is the city filled up with water. And you had a lot of people who couldn't leave. They either couldn't afford to leave or they didn't have public transportation. You know, we talked about some of these things in the voting unit. Um, where they had the elderly or sick people that they were taking care of, or maybe they had pets that they were taking care of. Um, it was the end of the month. Some of them didn't have money. And anyway, some people didn't leave. Okay. And then all of a sudden there are all these people on rooftops as buildings are flooded. And it was just, it was just a mess. It was a mess. And the national government didn't actually step in and try to help out for a number of days. You had a lot of people who ended up at the football stadium um, in New Orleans, and um, it was sort of like a madhouse and free-for-all, violence and, um, you know, people fighting for 
for food and water. And then of course, you know, the sewage system overflowed. Um, the problem is that after 9-11, the, um, the government passed a law called um, the Patriot Act. And part of that is the establishment of a new department, cabinet department called Homeland Security. And with Homeland Security, it meant that instead of the director of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, instead of the FEMA director being able to talk directly to the president, it had to go through the Department of Homeland Security. Well, the ball was dropped somewhere and communication was broken up somewhere and needless to say, help did not come. In fact, to the point where um, whenever you think of like a president and if there's a, like a huge disaster, they now call it that president's Katrina because George W. Bush, this was a time period where a lot of people think he failed. We have different kinds of powers. And I'm doing, doing this backwards. I used to do this unit before we did the Constitution, but I thought it would actually make more sense to you once you've already read the Constitution. So first we have delegated or enumerated powers. These are powers granted to the national government in the Constitution. It means there are some different kinds. Some of them are written out. Some of them are implied or inherent. And we'll see what that means. Enumerated means like numbered out. Expressed powers. These are powers given to the national government. They are clearly spelled out, um, you know, like where it talks about Congress has the power to declare war. It is spelled out. There's no question about what that means. So there are 27 congressional powers. They include things like coining money, laying and collect collecting taxes, regulating foreign and interstate commerce. So any business that crosses state lines or um, goes out of the country is under the purview of Congress. They can, as I said before, declare war, raise and maintain armed forces. They can determine patents and copyrights. We saw that when we read that through in the uh, Constitution. There are more. Article 2, Section 2 is about the presidential powers in the Constitution. And one power of the president is that he is commander in chief of the armed forces. And that is written very explicitly into the Constitution, as you'll remember. He can grant pardons and reprieves, again, written in the Constitution. He can make treaties. Now, he needs two-thirds of the Senate in order to confirm them, but it's written in the Constitution that the president can do that. He can appoint federal officials to different levels of government, like federal judges. Again, he needs Senate confirmation, but um, ultimately it's written in the Constitution that the president can do this. Article three of the Constitution is about the judiciary branch, and this explains the judicial powers of the United States government. And primarily, if you remember, it's fairly short, but it says primarily the Supreme Court is established. And remember, all lower federal courts are, are um, established by Congress. There are 27 amendments, as you know, that contain additional expressed powers for each branch of government. Um, if you remember going through them, you'll know that there are some things written in there very specifically that the government can and cannot do. Yeah, can, well, we'll get to that in a second. Hold on. Implied powers. Now, if something's implied, it means that it's believed to be true, even if it isn't stated. Okay. So they're po these are powers that are not expressly stated or written in the Constitution, but reasonably assumed based on the expressed powers. And I talked about this in class. So if I said, if, if Congress has the power to declare war, and that's written in the Constitution, there are a whole mess of things that Congress gets to do in order to carry out that expressed power. Oh, Yoda's there just because I looked up ex implied powers on Google Images and Yoda showed up. And so I liked it. So I kept it. Article 1, Clause 18. Ooh, this is the biggie. This is the necessary and proper clause. These are the powers that are needed to carry out those express powers. So Article 1, Article 1 um, talks about that, shoot, sorry, someone just walked in and then I got lost in my train of thought. Um, the necessary and proper clause is where the, the power, the implied powers come from. It says that Congress can do whatever is necessary and proper to carry out the expressed powers. 
We call it the elastic clause because it has been stretched to include so many different things. Congress has gotten really good at saying, oh, I think we need to be in control of that and we need to be control of this. Oh, oh, it's necessary and proper to in order for us to carry out this other thing. Some examples, uh, racial discrimination in access. That's something that um, Congress has deemed to be necessary and proper for them to be able to control. Moving stolen goods across state lines is a federal crime. It's not written in the Constitution, but they say this is how you take care of interstate commerce. Creation of highways and dams, again, part of interstate commerce. Why do you think? Well, if you have to transport goods or if you need to get electricity to businesses, sometimes you have to create highways and dams. These are all implied under the expressed power to regulate foreign and interstate commerce. That is where Congress gets a lot of its power. Now, inherent means that you have it just because you are that thing. So in this case, these are powers that belong to the national government simply because it is a government of a sovereign state in the world. Just because it's a government, it gets to do certain things. They aren't written. Okay, it's just assumed, and there aren't very many of them. But, you know, if you're a country, you're going to have to deal with people coming into your country. Inherently, you're going to have to be able to deal with things like immigration. If you're a country, you have to determine your borders. So acquisition of territory is something that just happens because you happen to be a government. Diplomatic recognition, recognizing that other countries exist protecting the country against rebellion or internal subversion or against um, foreign um, attack. Just because you're a country in the United States means, or I'm sorry, just because you're a country, you have certain powers that exist. But there are also powers that are denied to the national government. We call these, of course, the denied powers. The, pardon me. <coughs> sorry. The... Um, National government can't do it. These are written in the Constitution. Things like the government cannot deny freedom of speech, religion, assembly, etc. You all know what amendment that is, right? Hint, it's the first. Okay, that wasn't a hint. That was me just telling you. Um, denied powers. Government can't conduct illegal searches. Okay, it's Fourth Amendment. They cannot deny a trial by jury. Sixth and Seventh Amendment. There are other denied powers, though, by way of silence, which means if it's not stated that the national government can do it, then technically they can't. Not mentioned, not permitted. There's nothing about education in the Constitution. So the federal government cannot um, establish a public school system for the, United, for the nation. The United States can't enact uniform uh, marriage and divorce laws, although they can make sure that states don't discriminate against people, and that's from the 14th Amendment. Um, they can't set up local governments. That's a state power. So the federal government can't come into Montana and say, okay, we're going to organize this government in this state, or we're going to make this a city. So anything else that threatens the existence of a federal form of government, which means anything that, ex that threatens the existence of state powers, Reserved powers are from the 10th Amendment. These are the powers held by the states in a federal government. These are those powers not already given to the national government and yet not denied to the states, because there are some things written in there that the states can't do, are given to the states. They're reserved for the states. Again, this is the 10th Amendment. Marriage and divorce laws, public school systems, licensing of professions, gambling. The laws, if you, if you think about it, the laws for those are different from state to state. Um, like for, for marriage, you know, some states require blood tests, you know, to make sure you're not related um, before you get married. Some states have no-fault divorces and others have um, alimony. I mean, there's all different kinds of things that states do differently. But there are powers denied to the states. They can't make their own treaties with foreign countries. They can't print or coin money. If you remember from the Articles of Confederation, this was a problem. They can't deprive a person of due process of law. So if you remember the two due process amendments, I'll give you a second, see if you can remember. You are right, they are five and 14. The Fifth Amendment deals with the federal government. The 14th Amendment says 
that they apply to the states as well. So you can't deprive a person of due process of law. States are also not allowed to tax the federal government within the state, just as the national government can't tax state agencies and functions. So like the national government can't come in and um, lay taxes on any state agencies. And the state of Montana can't tax like the floor service. There are exclusive powers. These are the ones that only can be exercised by the national government. These are the ones that the states cannot do. States can't regulate interstate commerce. And it's not necessarily because the constitution specifically in writing de denies them that power, but it also just makes a lot of sense because it would be super confusing. If Montana decided it was in charge of all interstate commerce for North Dakota and Wyoming and Idaho, uh, that would be problematic. States are allowed to affect, but not unreasonably burden interstate commerce. So like I could, you know, the state of Montana could have a speed limit that's different than North Dakota because that doesn't keep people from trading or selling things or transporting things through Montana. Um, so it can affect how fast they go. It can't affect whether or not they're allowed to be there. So as I said, regulation of speed limits, out-of-state vehicles, in-state vehicles, everyone's um, affected the same by those um, speed limits. Concurrent powers are those powers that are um, held by both the state and the national government. It means they're happening at the same time, but separately. The most important one and the one that's most obvious is the power to lay and collect taxes. So your state can tax you, property taxes or whatever, and the federal government can tax you. So you do, if you, those of you who work know that you file state income tax returns and federal income tax returns. The power to define crimes and set punishment. Okay, so the federal government has its own uh, criminal court system and so do the states. You could be convicted in state court, you could be convicted in federal court, and there's all different kinds of questions about jurisdiction. And when we get to the judicial branch, we'll talk more about that. The power to take property for public use. We've talked about eminent domain. Um, this idea that uh, the government, if they feel like it's in the best need of the people, like to make a bypass or widen a bridge or something like that, then that, um, is called eminent domain and they're allowed to take that property as long as they pay a fair uh, market value. So again, these powers are exercised separately, but simultaneously. So they're happening at the same time, but they're happening at different levels. So there's different kinds of federalism. You know, when dual federalism became cooperative federalism. So dual federalism is when the powers of the national and state governments are distinctly separate. We call that layer cake federalism. So it's very clear the local governments do this, the state governments do this, the federal governments do this, and sort of never the twain shall meet. Although that's three, so more than twain. Um, when you get to the New Deal um, with the, after the Great Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt implemented a new kind of federalism called cooperative federalism. And we call that marble cake federalism. And they did this because the nation was suffering so greatly, so much from the Great Depression that um, the federal government had to step in to help. And this is where things started to get a little bit different. So na national or nation, state, local governments, they all work together to solve common problems. And so you can see, like it's all sort of mixed together. They do things together. Sometimes the federal government steps in, sometimes the state steps in. We have pretty much what, what is called marble cake federalism in our country right now. One of the ways this is demonstrated is through money. So the federal government has what we call power of the person in many issues. So, I mean, you always wonder like, okay, if, if education is the, under the control of the states, why does the federal government get to tell us what to do? Well, we take money from the federal government and they get to attach conditions to that money. So there's different ways that the federal government can give money to the states or states and local governments. There are block grants, Federal grants given more or less automatically to states or communities to support broad programs in areas such as community de development and social services. So maybe a block grant might be something um, 
like for special education or something like that, where every state gets the same amount. Categorical grants, federal grants that can be used only for specific purposes or categories, state and local spending, they come with strings attached, okay? Such as non-discrimination provisions or conditions of aid, meaning we'll give you this money, but you can only use it for this, this, and this, and you can't do these other things with it. And if you agree to that, then we'll give you that money. Project grants are a kind of categorical grant. Uh, federal government gives it to the states on the basis of merit. So, you know, we sort of try out for them or we, we apply for these grants. And the city of Columbia Falls is always applying for grants and trying to get project grants, you know, to, you know, to update streets or make uh, streets safer, bridges safer, things like that. We might apply for a project grant. Formula grants are distributed to all states according to a formula. Um, usually it has to do with the number of people and poverty levels and all those good things. Not so good things, I guess that's not a good thing. Um, it's not merit-based, it's just based on a number. And then we have the unfunded mandates. These are regulations from the federal government that require a state or local government to perform certain actions, but they don't get any money to do it. So for instance, we have to make sure everything is ADA compliant, which is the American with Disabilities Act requirement, okay? We have to make that sure that, that that's, we do that, but nobody gives us any money to do it. It just has to come out of our own pocket. Um, efficiency and safety standards, again, things that are required, but we don't get any money to help carry them out. Sounds even and fair, doesn't it? So any conflict regarding the various powers of each government is dealt with in the Supremacy Clause, and we talked about this too. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And this is the order of ruling power. So the Constitution is first. Then comes acts of Congress and treaties. Then our state constitutions. Then state statutes. And a statute is a law. Then city and county charters and ordinances. So anything in like the city, the city of Columbia Falls code annotated. So that's the level, right? So you can't say, oh, I'm not going to follow something that is an act of Congress. You have to. You have to do all of those. If you're in the city, you have to follow all of these laws first. So we're not going to make a law in Columbia Falls that um, violates state laws. This is my funny little eminent domain cartoon. The Supreme Court acts as the empire among states and between the states and the national government, as it, that's in the Constitution. The, the case that uh, proved this essentially was McCulloch versus Maryland. And this is how the case went. And Congress in 1819 established a bank in Maryland, okay? Bank of the United States. Maryland decides to tax the bank in order to put it out of business. But remember, we have a law saying that states are not allowed to tax the federal government. The bank cashier of this federal bank didn't pay the taxes because he said it was unconstitutional. Maryland courts, the state courts, convict him for not paying the taxes. It is appealed, it goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court reverses the Maryland decision. And the significance of this more so than the issue of taxes is the fact that it says, see, Supreme Court wins. So whatever decision the Supreme Court made was of greater importance or greater um, authority than the Maryland courts. So this is the crash course that has to do with federalism. And um, feel free to watch it if you would like to. I think it does a pretty good job. It does talk a lot about grants and things like that. And I think that maybe explains them pretty well. And that is the end of our federalism lecture. I hope this wasn't too painful and have a great day.